Um, great, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for um, being with us this morning. I think your presence in such large numbers reflect the timeliness and the importance of today's conversation. Um, for those of us who don't know about CHASER, the Center for Historical Analysis and Conflict Research, is probably the only think tank with a tank outside of its activities. <laughs> so, um, but we are British Army's own internal think tank, and our mandate is quite um, straightforward, and we are here to help the conceptual component of fighting power. And we achieved that vision um, via multiple products and outputs on the far right, not reflecting our political views, but in terms of your slides, um, we, ha we produce books and publications, and most of our publications are available on the AKX, including our lecture series, which we aim to do once a month, and you can see the backlog at the AKX and watch them. It features a wide range of speakers, just like John today. Um, we do wargaming. We have a great in-house wargaming kit that we developed, and again, you can download that. Use it. We did roundtables, workshops, battlefield study tours, as well as a monthly um, global analysis program snapshot. If you want a monthly single email that tells you what is happening in the world, new studies, new research, or relevance for your work, sign up for it, and you also get a briefing once a month from us about a specific issue that we commission external experts to write for us. Um, What's next on our agenda? Obviously, the next lecture, which is, um, the date is there, 15 November. It's on Northern Ireland and Brexit. Obviously, there's a political aspect of that conversation, which is unfolding in public, but there are a lot of defense and security questions about the future of Northern Ireland and current developments. Um, and, and Katie is an academic based at the Queen's University, Belfast, and she's quite plugged in. Um, interestingly, her academic expertise is on borders, <laughs> timely for her. Um, now, um, so if you want to join us, please sign up, um, reach us through our inbox. And again, um, our next briefing, which we are releasing later in this month, is about the reintegration of former ISIS members. It's written by a Syrian researcher, so it draws from a lot of first-hand research that he's been doing within Syria. And next month, our briefing will look at Libya and the current clash is unfolding that written by a Libyan researcher who goes back and forward between Libya and UK. And I have to advertise my book that just came out, um, which looks at religion and violence and conflict in time for Christmas, for stockings. Um, my mother-in-law loved it. I don't think she'll ever read it, but that's okay. So please do buy it. If you don't read it, I don't mind. Um, but the biggest thing on our agenda, as you've seen the shiny video um, that we produced on 6th of December, we'll have a single day, which will hopefully enable you um, at every level of the army to get exposed to strategic conversations about the trends that are impacting what you do in your, in your jobs and the future of our organization planning and deployments. The keynote speaker has actually has just been confirmed, Tim, Marsh Tim Marshall, who's the author who wrote the, um, the Prisoners of Geography and other popular books. Um, he will op kick off the day with a global overview of current trends, and then we'll go down to four different panels. Panel one looking at um, Europe and transatlantic relationship with a top notch of speakers, and Shashang Joshi will chair that, who's the new editor for The Economist, defense editor. Um, ses um, session three will look at um, conflict hotspots, i.e. Iraq, Afghanistan, the Sahel region, and North Africa. We have a couple of other speakers that will be confirmed this week. And the third, the fourth panel will look at media and information, um, chaired by David Patrick Karakos, who wrote the book War in 140 Characters, which many of you have read. will include Jamie Bartlett, the author of The Dark Net, um, Anne-Marie Tomchak, who is a really great um, journalist in tune with what's happening in the media space, and Allied Naylor, she just is about to release a book on Russian social media and internet activities looking at the Baltics region. So we'll be discussing a, a lot of hands-on issues and the final session, chaired by um, General Andrew Sharp, who's um, our um, um, director at the Chaser 2, including other senior um, military army leaders, reflecting on so what of all of these things that are unfolding. It's a paid event, so you need to sign up and you need to buy to make sure that you'll be here. Uh, so please do. It's actually filling up rather nicely. Um, before I proceed on today's lecture and why you are here, I'm told to remind you, in case of fire, <laughs> Please follow gently and slowly the exit signs that are here and there and there. Um, and the polo field that way is actually where we gather. Um, there are no oxygen masks, so you don't have to put it on yourself first and the person next to you next. Um, today's speaker, John Saifu, all of you pretty much have seen the advertisement and the details about him. He's written an amazing briefing paper for us, which is available on the AKX on today's topic, which is Russian active measures. But John has a distinguished um, um, background in, in the CIA. Um, as you can see, these snapshots, 
snapshots from his um, background. He's well positioned, not only just on Russia, actually, a broad range of issues of relevance to us in areas that he has served to really give us an insight into um, what we observe. Is it new? Is it old? What is new, actually, about what Russia is doing? Is post-truth really a new age? Um, what changed, actually, with the social media or didn't? Or are we actually seeing the continuation or something new. Um, so John will come up um, and we'll speak from 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and then I'll join him at the front. Um, we'll ask him a couple of questions and then we'll open it up to you to ask. Um, you all have heard Chatham House Rules. We have a Chaser House Rules. Um, and that means primarily that we encourage all of you to ask questions, regardless of your rank or your experience, as long as they're questions, not statements or another talk. You're more than welcome to us engage with our speaker. His talk will be on record, will go on AKX, but the question and answer time will not be, um, so we can have a more frank discussion. Um, John has kindly allowed you to tweet and to take pictures and to share in public if you want to, um, but still um, exercise um, regular caution. And do please tag Chaser underscore Camberley if you are tweeting about today's event. John. Oh, it works up here. Hi there. It's a little intimidating, but thank you guys very much for having me here. Um, so again, my, my name is John Seifer. I, I spent almost 30 years in CIA. I was in the clandestine services side of CIA, so the sort of spy side. You know, we're sort of a tribal organization. We have the fancy scientists and then the analysts that provide the all-source intelligence to our policymakers. Those are like the smart guys. And the sort of obnoxious guys are the guys that go overseas and pretend to be State Department and Foreign Officer people. And so that's where I, I spent my time. And so my thesis today is really sort of, is sort of simple. It's when we look at the Russian state and when we look at Russian foreign policy now, it really helps to have sort of a, a spy's a, a knowledge of sort of how countries spy and how they think about things. Because as long as Vladimir Putin's in power, his KGB past and his... His, his and his regimes looking at every foreign policy issue almost through the lens of operational espionage and sabotage and all of the, the, the tricks of the spy trade are going to be central to their foreign policy aspects. So for most countries, the intelligence services are sort of an adjunct to the side. Their job is to collect intelligence and provide analysis to policymakers to make decisions. In the Russian space, the intelligence and security service has always been central to the state up through the Soviet days. And even now, because of Vladimir Putin's past, they still are, instead of just being involved in collection of intelligence and analysis of intelligence, they are more concerned with issues like sabotage and disinformation and, and uh, subversion and sort of these kind of issues. And so that's what we call, and we're learning about, is, is, is active measures. And the other basic theme is looking at the history of the intelligence services and indeed the history of the Soviet Union in Russia is really central to understanding to, of what they're doing to us today. Um, and so, you know, in the United States, before any new ambassador went to Moscow during the Cold War days, during the Soviet days, they would trek up to Princeton University to see our, probably our most famous and, and greatest diplomat, George Kennan. When George Kennan had served in Moscow, he was the... Uh, the man that wrote the famous uh, Mr. X article in foreign affairs in the United States, which sort of set the, the boundary for what the United States would look at how to, how to take on the Soviet Union. So, and so he became our most sort of famous diplomat. And so every new ambassador, when Mr. Kennan um, retired and moved uh, up to Princeton, would go up to see him. And at some point during that discussion, they would, they would ask him, you know, kindly, sir, t tell me, you know, what is it that I should know what is it that I can study or prepare for to prepare to go to Moscow? And the story goes to every one of those ambassadors throughout the Cold War, Kennan's response was, I encourage you to go over here to the Firestone Library in Princeton or any academic library whatsoever, find any book about Russia in the 18th or 19th century, any, read that and you'll know more about present day Soviet Union than you need to do from any contemporary book. Which was his way of saying, even though the Soviet Union and communism was, was seen as something different, there's something eternal about the Russian mindset of Russian culture that you have to understand if you're going to understand today. And sort of that's my, my thesis is essentially, you know, it's the same thing with the active measures we saw in 2016 in the United States. 
and you're seeing around Europe now, and so these constant operations and things that are working against us. Let's see if this works. Oh, Jesus, now I'm going backwards. <coughs> Sorry about that. As you can also see, unlike, you can tell that I'm not a professional military officer, because in the United States, the, the one thing I think they learned in the first, their first year is how to do PowerPoint slides. And in the CIA, we always made fun of our military colleagues because we were like, we would use three by five cards and we would stand up and we, if you came to any kind of lecture with a, with a PowerPoint, you would be sort of whistled down. And so we always made fun of our, our military colleagues. But now, of course, when you come outside, we're, we're unprepared. And I, all I can do is paste pictures up. I can't really do all the fancy stuff. So I apologize for the thing. So going back, I, you know, I don't want to go back too far, but one of the things you need to know about is, it, when the Soviet state took over, when Lenin took over Russia in 1917, 1918, to make the beginnings of the Soviet Union, one of the first things they did was to create a secret service, to create an intelligence and police service. That service from the beginning was very clear about that they were about mass terror, they were about keeping the leadership in power under any circumstances, to destroy any version of internal dissent and keep external enemies away. So Felix Dzerzhinsky was the first head of what they called the Cheka. So the Cheka was the first Soviet intelligence which, arm, which then became the KGB, and now today's SVR, FSB, and GRU. And, it, and to, to this day, um, all members of, that have grown up through the intelligence service, to include Vladimir Putin, make sure that on Czechist day, every day in December, I think it's December 20th, that they're in Moscow to, to celebrate Czechist Day. So to this day, people like Putin and others see themselves as Czechists, and it's a very important thing for them. So um, interestingly, one of the, the first acts, so say, so you, you're, you've created a new state from the Russian state at the end of World War I. One of the first things they did before they even had had really an economic policy or foreign policy is they ran a sophisticated active measures operation called the trust operation. And we study it in the CIA and anybody going into the Russian intelligence services today study the trust operation. And it's really become a model for you know, a century of activities by the Russian state. And it sort of is a model for what we saw in, we saw in the States in 2016. Um, the trust operation, again, it was the beginning of the state and what they did is they created a fake organization called the Monarchist Union of Central Russia. And this was meant to be an underground organization, anti-Bolshevik, anti-Soviet organization, which would pull in anyone who wanted to destroy the Soviet state. And so it was worldwide. They had people in France and in England and you know, this, this sort of nascent intelligence service created a, a sort of a global anti-Bolshevik, anti-Soviet organization so that they could control their enemies and people who were trying to destroy the state. So if you were in France and you were, you were from a white Russian and an emigre and you wanted to you know, take down the Bolshevik regime, you know, there would be cells and people you could connect to and, and, and meetings you could go to. And they ran this organization for like three or four years, this sort of mirage, to pull in everybody who was potential enemies around the world. And then after three or four years, they had sort of a list of everybody who was working against them that they could then pull together and kill. So right from the beginning, the, the skill set they had was these subversion, sabotage, fake organizations like this. And in fact, one of the first people who was, was pulled in was this uh, Sidney Riley, who was called the Ace of Spies, a British spy who was, who was lured to Russia as part of this trust operation and executed. Um, and so it's, it's interesting how this nascent intelligence service was able to trick and fool much longer standing and sophisticated intelligence services throughout Europe. And, but you know, one of the th places that they learned from is from the, the Russian Tsarist Okhrana, which was the security and intelligence services before the Bolshevik state. And interestingly, if we look back and we remember about Stalin and Lenin, you know, those are cover names. They're, they're, they weren't their real names. They were the names that they used in underground activities to try to stay away from and hide from the Tsarist secret police, the Okhrana. So that's a picture of Stalin there in his Okhrana um, file. This is Trotsky over here. And um, so even by 1904, they, 1904, they had a, what they called the Higher School of Maskaroka. They had, 
you know, they were putting their intelligence officers and military people through uh, official courses on how to run this de strategic deception and trickery and masquerade was like masking operations. Um, one of the things that, that's incredible about even the Okhrana and this sort of Russian security mindset is um, in the late 19th century, they created this, this book called The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. And what's, what's fascinating is to this day, like on the, Hama, on the Hamas um, you know, website, the, the Hamas, whatever you call it, that started the Hamas, they still refer to this. This is, a, this is a fantastic forgery. It's a fake story about a group of, you know, senior Jewish leaders who would meet secretly to try to, to rule the world. And it was, it was an anti-Semitic thing created by the Russian Secret Service to try to put out there to, to be, you know, anti-Jewish. Anti and to this day, it's still used by Holocaust deniers, Hamas, people in the Middle East. This is, this is a 120-year-old you know, forgery by the, the Russian secret services, um, which then led into what the, what the Cheka became and the, and the, the forerunners to the KGB. So um, Mr. Putin you know, still to this day says that he is a, a proud Czechist. He refers back to their Czechist past um, and it's important to him. Uh, you know, he, his early life in Leningrad, you know, he always wanted to be an intelligence officer. He tells stories about how he'd watch movies about the KGB, and he realized the KGB was the central um, institution of the state, and he wanted to be part of the, of the sword and shield protecting the Soviet state. Um, he worked in Leningrad in their sort of inter going after internal dissent for a number of years, and finally moved into what was sort of the more elite units and went overseas to Dresden which was in East Germany at the time. In his sort of biography where he talks about what impelled him, why, you know, why, why is he the man he is, he talks about in Dresden, the, the wall, when he was there, the wall was falling and the Soviet Union was starting to splinter apart. And at one point, um, as people were, as the wall was falling and people were, were going to the Stasi headquarters, the East German intelligence service, there was protesters coming around the, the Russian consulate where he was in Dresden. And, and he tells a story about how he contacted one of the Russian tank commanders, because there was you know, a large Russian military presence in East Germany, and said, hey, there's protesters here. We have, we have classified and secret information here. I need military help to surround the consulate um, so that you know, people don't break into the, the consulate. And uh, he contacted a military officer. The military officer said, I can't redeploy forces without, um, without approval from Moscow. I've contacted Moscow, and Moscow is silent. And he tells that story that, you know, being part of a superpower in one of the great, you know, states, when the push came to shove, Moscow was silent. Moscow was weak. When, when time came, the state fell apart. And he says to this day, you know, I said to myself, if I ever have the ability to deal with it, Russia will never be weak again. We'll always be strong. And when push comes to shove, we'll be able to respond appropriately to these type of things. Hillary Clinton tells a similar story about when she first met with Vladimir Putin. He, t he told her a story about um, his father had fought on, the, on the, the Leningrad front against the Nazi army. And as you remember, the siege of Leningrad, it was terrible. People, there was cannibalism, there were you know, incredible amounts of deaths. And he tells a story that his father had a 24-hour leave to come home to see the family. And at this time, there was piles of dead bodies in Leningrad, and he tells this Putin tells the story to Mrs. Clinton that you know, he came back through the streets of Leningrad to go home and noticed a pile of bodies and saw his wife's legs with shoes under a pile of bodies and went crazy and tried to pull her out. And the police were grabbing him and try telling him to stop. You know, there's nothing you can do. And eventually he did. He pulled the woman out from under the pile and it, she was alive and they were able to eventually nurse her back to, to health. And, and Hillary Clinton tells a story that Vladimir Putin tells this story because in his mind, he sees himself as the person who's pulling the lifeless body of Russia out from under the pile to sort of re-energize re it and, and bring it back to health. Um, one more point about you know, Putin's time in the KGB. His mentor and the person that he, he has spoken about that he sees as the, as the most important was Yuri Andropov. And Yuri Andropov was a very powerful head of the KGB and eventually chairman of the, of the Communist Party. And he brought the KGB during his time in the late 70s and 80s um, to be the central, the KGB was always the sword and shield and the, 
and a critical central part of the state, but the Communist Party was above everything. Um, by the time Andropov became Communist Party chairman, he had sort of made the, K the KGB almost the central and, and, and uh, defining institution in the, in the Soviet state, and he made it very clear that repression, um, violence, brutality, uh, anything to protect the leadership and protect the state would be accepted. And uh, Putin sees uh, Andropov as his sort of key mentor, and when he becomes president, he makes sure to put plaques on the Rublyanka, he has, he has a statue made to Andropov, and he makes it clear to people that he's around, that, that um, Andropov is sort of his, his hero. And so, again, he believes that the KGB sh is and should be a central part of the, of the Russian state. Um, Oleg Kalugin, it was a KGB officer, the, the youngest person to become a general in, in the KGB. That's him with Kim Philby in, in Moscow. Um, and, and this goes back to the point I said before, whereas most intelligence services are about you know, perhaps spying, using satellites and other things to collect intelligence, you know, to put together analysis for leaders. The, the Soviet state and the Russian state is, is about subversion. Not intelligence collection, but subversion. And this is, this is written from back the 1970s, and it, you can see how it resonates today. It's about discord among allies, weaken the United States in the eyes of the people of Europe, Asia, Africa, make America more vulnerable to anger and distrust of other people. He tells stories, he served in, in New York and Washington, he tells stories about their routine work there was things like they would put on gloves and buy typewriters to write up, you know, incredibly racist notes to give to African ambassadors in the UN to try to show that the, the United States was, was, was tremendously racist and then they would use Soviet TASS or these other places to report on these horrible things that racist Americans were saying to people in the third world. He talks about how they would they would use intelligence methods to, to break away and they would go and they would desecrate Jewish cemeteries and synagogues and put up swastikas on, on synagogues and again, find a way to report this about, about what's going on in the United States. So it was all these, these tricks and these constant sort of games that are going on. So th again, they, what we see in 2016 is a function of this subversion rather than intelligence collection. It's about disinformation, propaganda, prov provoc provocation, um, cyber attacks, trolls, bots, all these things that we've seen. This is not something new. This is something that has been central to the way Soviet intelligence services have worked forever. And so, you know, right from the beginning, Lenin, you know, said these kind of things that, you know, a lie told often enough becomes the truth. Um, and, and I think we're seeing that now with the, you know, the Skripal attacks here, this what we call implausible deniability, the, the, you know, the lies, the, the no concern whatsoever about you know, the hypocrisy and as long as you deny and lie, there's always gonna be a number of people who think like, God, you, you lie so, <laughs> so blatantly and strongly that there must be an element of truth in what you say. Um, when you know, people who are paying attention realize that, it, that it's just for their own purposes. Um, I don't want to overdo this stuff, but part, again, of, the, of this view of how the intelligence services are used is a strategic framework. And this, Grasimov's the head of the, the general staff, still, in, in Russia, and he talks about, there used to be um, bold in there somewhere, so I forget where the key points are, but he's talking about the role of non-military means of achieving political and strategic goals has grown, in many cases, has exceeded the power of force of weapons in their effectiveness. So he's talking about using what they call reflexive um, control is something they study there about try, finding ways to weaken your enemy, to weaken their will, to weaken their resolve, so that in case of war, you have de decimated the enemy and put yourself in the best position to control events. And this is exactly the same kind of things we've seen, these, these asymmetric measures. So in many ways, um, you can look and view these active measures is almost like terrorism. It's an asymmetric means for a weaker power to take on a stronger power. Um, if you don't have the means to take on that stronger power or those allied powers head on, you have to find ways to look for weaknesses, work around the edges, and, and, and do things. So active measures is a means to look for potential weaknesses in your adversary and exploit those and amplify those problems um, so that 
they are weaker, there's more chaos there, and prepare yourself in case of war. So let me give you just a few examples of you know, these kind of active measures campaigns that took, took place during the Cold War leading up to today. So, for example, there was, there was a very strong Soviet active measures campaign to create the fiction that the Pentagon had created the AIDS virus. And it was part of a biological weapons program that was created to keep the, to keep the third world down by spreading AIDS throughout Africa and other places. And in the, in the old days, for the Russians to um, put out this information, they had to do things. They had to use recruited spies and sources in places like India to put these false stories into the Indian press and then use the Soviet press or other recruited sources to, to then report on that and try to move it up through the media food chain report on, someone to write this story, so that eventually some kind of story that just started in, a, in an Indian rag would work its way up and, and hopefully make its way to the West. Of course, what we have now is with social media and the use of algorithms and stuff, you no longer have to work your way up the media food chain by putting a story in an Indian press. You can just pay to put it directly online and algorithms and likes and, and, and we will do the rest of it for them. So now you can, these abilities that they had during the Cold War, you can weaponize that and do it times 100. But for example, this a the view on you know, AIDS, it was in some places in the, in the West, in the US, we sort of laughed at this effort that they were trying to spread this disinformation that we had created the AIDS virus. But there was a, a very human um, outgrowth to this. For, so down here on the left, it's just to remind me that like, for example, in Zimbabwe, they had a terrible problem with the AIDS virus. Um, death was, you know, people were, young men and were dying by the thousands. And, the WHO and, and international health professionals were working with people in Zimbabwe to try to help them understand what was causing the AIDS virus, that, you know, trying to teach about safe sex, about using um, syringes and all these type of things. And they're starting to have some success when the vice president of Zimbabwe came on public television and gave a speech. And during the speech, he mentioned that his son had AIDS. And at the time, Western professionals and health professionals were really excited about this because it was like the first time someone in power in Zimbabwe acknowledged that AIDS touched them personally and they thought this might be a turning point where people would understand the, the dangers and it would be a chance to educate the public. But no, instead, in his next phrase, Nakomo said, but what these people are teaching you about safe sex and drugs, it's wrong because AIDS is a creation of the United States and the Western powers to try to keep us down and so there's nothing you can do to stop it because it's a weapon being used by the West against us. So you think about the tens of thousands of people who died and suffered because of a, a Soviet Russian disinformation campaign. Another one down here on the right, that's our embassy in, in Pakistan. I served in Pakistan during one of my times in that crappy old embassy. Um, uh, there's a book called Siege of Mecca, which is a good book about one of the early Al Qaeda groups took over, in 1979, took over the Grand Mosque in Mecca. And uh, they held it for several weeks. It's a fascinating story. And it really, they, they were a group that saw the Saudi leaders as apostates and not religious enough. And, and they took it over. Eventually, I think they had the French special forces come in to help take them out. But, but the Russians used this opportunity to spread a fiction throughout the Islamic world that US Marines were in the Holy Mosque in Mecca and unbelievers and dirty keffers were you know, walking around and, and uh, desecrating holy spaces. Um, this had the effect in places far from Saudi Arabia to include Pakistan. This enraged the Pakistani citizenry that believed that, that uh, US Marines were there in the holy sites. And they stormed our embassy and, and burned it to the ground, killed a number of Americans and, and uh, Marine security guards. So there's these, these, these games that they play have real sort of consequences. Add assassination to the uh, the picture, so you know there, there's scrap all up there, but there's 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 a long history of these type of things. There's a book called um, "The Man with the Poison Gun" about the effort to kill the guy up here, Stepan Bandera. So in the late 1950s, Stepan Bandera was a um, Ukrainian nationalist who was living in Munich, was found dead in the hallway of his apartment building of an apparent heart attack. And it wasn't until several years later that a, a Soviet KGB officer defected to the West and told the story about how he 
very much like Screetball, uh, was sent to case, follow him, look for opportunities, and use uh, a KGB-created poison ampule gun that he kept in a newspaper so that eventually one day he was able to follow Screetball home and in the hallway of his apartment building, shoot him with this ampule poison, which made it look like he had a heart attack to die. And this, this KGB officer described a number of other assassinations that he had been sent on to do. And so these are the kind of things that, that it, it's, it, um, in, the, in the communist days, if you were part of the, the Soviet superpower, perhaps there was a view, if you were in the secret services or intelligence services, that you were working for something bigger. Nowadays, of course, if you work in the Russian SVR, GRU, you look at your bosses and you see the corruption and the incredible riches up there. And uh, you know, there's not a lot of positive motivation to work for that organization. So I think the, the leadership has to maintain that brutality and that fear of, sure, go play footsie with the British or go play footsie with the Americans. At some point, the long arm of the Cummins is gonna find you and kill you or get your family. And so they need to use that negative stimulus to keep people going. So there's the other one here, obviously, Litvinenko, who was, was, was killed with radio, radioactive uh, weaponry. There's other ones, Rudolf Nuria, famous ballet dancer. The, the Soviets sent people out to break his legs after he defected to the West. Um, here's some more, so there's the, this guy's Stasinski there, the, the bald guy, the KGB guy, that's sort of the, a model of the, the gun he was using with the gun. These are here's your guys in Salisbury. Uh, Yushchenko was the, the Ukrainian prime minister, obviously hit with poison and these kind of things. So the point is that what we're seeing today is not new. The desire by the Soviet state to liquidate enemies right from the beginning of the Czechist thing was so important that in the lead up to World War II, as Hitler was threatening the Soviet Union with annihilation, the Russian intelligence service's main focus was on finding Trotsky to liquidate him, to kill him in Mexico. So they were more focused on finding their internal enemies and killing them than they were learning about Hitler's intentions about invading, invading the Soviet Union. Uh, take this one step further. So of the things that we now know we call active measures, so there's a disinformation, there's a deception, there's the assassination, there's the forgeries, there's the use of cyber attacks, all these other kind of things. In their doctrine, they've always made it clear and this would be the same for us in the West, what we call covert action, is the central factor of any effective active measures campaign is spies, is recruited spies. You have to have somebody inside that is aiming you and helping you. Um, for us in the intelligence world, one of the best kind of sources, spies that we can have, are, are, are people who can take action on your behalf. If you can recruit someone who's the foreign minister or the prime minister um, to take action for you, that's the best thing we have. So, in 2016, if we look at the things that were deployed against the United States, we've seen the, the trolls and the bots, and we've seen the cyber attacks, and we've seen the assassination. Um, the part that's still unclear to us is where are the real spies that were helping them? How did they know to go into Wisconsin and certain parts of Wisconsin to, put, to weaponize information in that place that would help in the elections, those type of things? So I guarantee that there's still you know, we're, we're looking at the GRU and they're fumbling and their things. I still think people in the SVR and others were running spies, collusion, if you will, to help them do the things that they did. Um, so a lot of people always ask me, what is, you know, do you like Homeland? Which is the best sort of spy show you like? But the, the Americans is the, the one I tend to like, which is about the Russia Illegals program. So um, for, from the beginning of the Soviet state, they created, as I talk about the Cheka spy service, which was very focused on internal repression, but creating sort of chaos abroad. And so they then also created a collection and they were, they were better at it than, than many of us. They recruited people in our own services around the world uh, that worked out of embassies like our, we tend to do in our spy services. But they also created this other thing called the illegals. And the notion was as you, they created the Soviet state, there was a lot of countries that did not recognize the Soviet Union. And so their fear was that if they built in the embassy and they ran their spy operations out of the embassy, the legal residency, they call it. We call it a station in CIA. Um, if that country decided to close them down or kick them out, which we're doing now, they would have a strategic reserve set aside of legal, illegals that looked like local citizens. So for example, my first tour overseas was in Finland. And in, the, in World War II, when the, when the Soviets attacked and took over the eastern part of Finland, Karelia, 
the Finns, you know, fled from that area and left behind, you know, the churches and schools and some of these old church records. The Soviets would go in the old church records and find people, children who died at birth, and take those names and that information and use them to create false legends and uh, data so that they could then create a new Finn, train that person in language, send that person overseas to say live in Switzerland as a business person, eventually then, after a number of years, moved to England, and that person would look like a Finnish national businessman living in England, no association whatsoever with the Soviet or Russian embassy, and that person would be a r trained Soviet intelligence officer who is a strategic reserve to, in case of war, you know, they were burying weapons, they were ready in case that the, the Soviet diplomats got kicked out, they could run the top spy cases and others. So that's what the illegals are. And what's interesting now, I think we're seeing now with, with Facebook and their use of social media, they're creating, you know, digital illegals. And so, for example, over here, this was a, a Facebook post. This is a complete Russian fake. They, they put together sort of false pictures of this person, fake children. But even when some of this stuff was uncovered, and Facebook or Twitter and these other people tried to look into this to, to um, deal with it, they found that incredible backstopping on these things. So when they went to these people and said, hey, this, this is, you know, we found that picture, that's someone from Brazil, this is not Melvin Reddick, that doesn't make any sense, you need to provide us information, background information, you know, birth certificates, whatever. The Russians had created false ones to back this up, so a number of these couldn't be taken down because they couldn't prove that they are Russian fakes when indeed they when indeed they were. So like you know, you almost call this digital illegals. And the issue of deception I can talk about later. Um, so, you know, wh what was different about 2016? I don't want to dwell on it too much. These are some of the crazy memes and things. This is the troll factory in, in St. Petersburg that was pu pumping out a lot of this information uh, around the I have a picture thing here. So so to me you know, what was different about 2016? If, if indeed the Russians have been doing this stuff forever, why was it more successful in our election this time? And I mentioned one thing already. Obviously, the ability to, to weaponize social media in a much more effective way was part of that. And one of the things that's sophisticated about what they did, it wasn't just, you know, if you're a hardcore Republican, it wasn't like if you saw this stuff, you were going to change your mind to become a Democrat. It was more subtle than that. It was about creating behavior changes. It was taking people, say, on the right wing of po politics that normally would never vote, stoking up the outrage so much so that they'd actually take action and go vote. And on the other side, say in like black communities or something in the states, was to, was to create narratives that, that maybe kept them home from voting by saying, hey, Hillary Clinton is someone that would be a waste of your time to go out and vote for him. So they're trying to suppress voting on one side of the extreme and then and in, increase outrage and, and get people to come out and vote on the other side and then take these sort of radical things and mainstream that information. Um, the other thing that was uh, a little bit different, I think about 2016, the one thing that the Russians have that they benefit, unlike us, is the United States, obviously, we're focused on North Korea and Iran and terrorism and China and Russia, among all these other kind of things. The Russians have a real strong, as you guys in the military know, there's a unity of command, a very clear message. The United States is the main enemy. Dividing the United States from Europe is our main focus. And every element of power, whether it be the Ministry of Defense, whether it be the Foreign Ministry, whether it be these trolls, whether, whether there's cyber hackers, whether it's their intelligence services, they all know, screw the United States. That's my goal. And so I think by, by summer of 2016, spring of 2016, you know, if everyone's moving in the same direction, there's just there's opportunities come up. So you can imagine everybody coming back and saying, hey, look, we have stuff from the Democratic National Committee here, and we have information over here, and we have this spy source here, and we're having success pushing these narratives over here. They're able to sort of put this stuff together uh, and have a, have a really good effect. It had probably a better effect because we in the United States weren't paying enough attention. We were so focused for the last number of years on terrorism that we weren't as focused on Russia stuff. Obviously, there was a small group of people who understood the Russians are a pain in the ass, and they would never stop being a pain in the ass, and this stuff would keep going, but it wasn't at our executive level seen as, a pro as an issue. And there's sort of this view in the United States, this sort of cultural view, and you've seen it with various presidents, and it even is insider services that, hey, you know, the Russians are, they're, really, they're Europeans. They look like us. 
you know, if, if there's a problem, it's probably because we're not communicating well enough. Like, they should be natural allies. They have a radical Islamic problem, too. Like, you know, we should, they should be allies. And of course, people who've worked with the Russians have been burned enough times to realize that, you know, they're, they're completely different. They think differently. They see themselves differently. They see the West as enemies. Um, they never had reformation. They never had a renaissance. They never had civic duties and things like, like we do here in the, in the West. And so it's a very different place. But we've had presidents that looked into their soul. We've had people who wanted to do resets. We've had people inside the services saying, hey, these are our natural allies on terrorism. So I don't think we were, we were paying attention. Another thing I think that made 2016 a little bit different is, I think, Putin's rage. His sense of resentment and betrayal over the, the years to NATO, to the West, to our activities in the Balkans, all these things had, had stoked to a certain point where his level of willingness to take risk was probably higher than it was before. He saw Hillary Clinton you know, as a real enemy. Her comments and her activities in 2012, when he was running for president, that brought protesters onto the street he was able to internalize that and believe that it was pushed by the State Department, by Hillary Clinton personally, and he took this very seriously. I think one of the things we often forget, too, is the Panama Papers. So shortly after that, the Panama Papers came out. Journalists uncovered this Latin American bank or whatever it was, company that had incredible, showed incredible Russian wealth. It showed Putin's money. It showed friends around him, low-level friends that had billions of dollars. And I think Putin took this as a direct attack from the West. They think he thinks he's the CIA or the United States or the British or somebody was using this directly against him to embarrass him, to show his money, to, to weaken him in, in Russia, and he took this personally. But the main thing, I think, other than us not being prepared and them being willing to do this and their ability to weaponize information, was we were dry tinder for this. Active measures doesn't create the problems. It doesn't. It doesn't come up with a big strategic thing and say, here's how we're going to affect the West. It looks for our weaknesses and exploits them. And what was our weakness? Our weakness is we are tribal. Our politics has gotten so vicious and partisan that it was quite easy to stoke. It didn't take a lot of effort to turn the right wing against the left wing and to exploit the problems of the United States. So, so they had dry tinder, and they just needed to throw a match on it, and they did, and I think it worked. And the last one I would suggest you know, I don't have enough evidence for this, is I said any active measures campaign throughout history is, has been, their main point has been recruited spies and sources that help aim the work they do. And so that would be collusion. Is collusion something in 2016 that made it more effective than it that has been before? Did they have people in the Trump campaign or around the Trump campaign that were helping them figure out how best to do this, whether Cambridge Analytica or where to aim their efforts? So, I mean, I think this is the part that we haven't seen, but I think it's something that made 2016 different. And I'll go through this quickly because I think, I don't know how my time is, but I want to focus a little bit on how we operate in Moscow. And we can talk more about it during the, the question and answer session. But the main point here is that uh, this focus on sowing chaos abroad, this centrality of their intelligence and security services abroad is is even more inside. So they control, they control the population, they control foreigners in, in, in Russia such that our ability, meaning British and Americans and others, to really understand their culture and the Kremlin and the thinking and the political thinking there is very hard to discern because they put incredible resources into stopping what they see as espionage. And certainly what I was involved in was espionage in, in Russia, but there's NGOs and others and people that are working in Moscow that are also thwarted and stopped. So that's our embassy in Moscow, the sort of new one. And just let me tell a like, personal story to give a sense of, like, of the, the surveillance atmosphere and how they, they follow us around. So our houses are, are bugged. Our houses, at least everybody in the US embassy had video in their house, real-time video. We were followed everywhere, and that's not hyperbole. If I got up on my, and I went out at 2 o'clock in the morning, my surveillance teams were there smoking their cigarettes, ready to follow me around everywhere. Everybody I'd meet would be questioned. Um, if you were going through town and, and you were followed by surveillance and you went around a corner and you weren't seen while you were going there, they would bring dogs afterwards to sniff to see if you'd left anything behind. If there was post office boxes that you might have put something in, they'll tear them off the wall and they'll go through everything in there looking for fingerprints, looking for stuff. It's, it's an impressive environment. The embassy, you know, had, you know, microwave shot at it and, you know, people working inside the embassy to try to report on us and all these other kind of things. So the, the, the amount of effort we have to go through to 
run an operation in Moscow is quite intense. So I'll give you a story. I had a, the sneakers up there to remind me of this. So I had a friend that was in the, in the embassy with me, and uh, he's a big runner. And long winters in Moscow. Comes the springtime, he's going to be go for his first run. So he lived on a Leninsky Prospect, not too far from Gorky Park. So the first day he gets home, 6, 6.30, 6.45 at night, puts on his shoes and goes for a run out, goes through Gorky Park, around by the river, comes back home. No problem. Comes back the next day, plans to go for a run again. Where his sneakers are, where his shoes are, one of them's gone. He's like, oh, that's, that's weird. Like, I, I, uh, all right. So the next day he goes in to work. At the time, it wasn't that easy to find you know, athletic stores to buy shoes, but he bought himself a new pair of running shoes. Came home again, went for a run. Comes back the next day for his third run. Shoe is gone again. <laughs> the new shoes is gone. So he realizes what's happening here. So he walks into his living room, knowing that it's bugs, and looks at the living room ceiling and said, OK, here's the deal. I got to run. I'm a runner. You can keep taking my shoes if you want, but I'm going to keep buying new shoes every day. And so here's the just to give you a heads up, here's the route I'm going to take. Every day at 6.45, I'm going to run this way and this street and down to Gorky Park and, <laughs> and talk into his ceiling. Comes back the next day in both sets of shoes. <laughs> I've set up in the place. And when he goes for a run that night, he gets to the big iron gates of Gorky Park off the street, and little surveillance cars pull up, and they pop open the boot, and they had little foldable bicycles that they would jump on, and they followed him. <laughs> so it was just, it was just being polite. He wanted to get him a chance to do it. And there's a number of stories like that about how the, sort of the intensity of everything they're doing. So this, like I was mentioning, you know, when I was, before I got in Moscow, there was a, a fire in the embassy, and the KGB has... Um, team set aside so if there happens to be a fire as part of the firemen that come in or KGB teams with axes and things to, to tear into our safes and try to steal material from the, from the embassy. Um, they use dogs, the incredible surveillance activities. Nowadays, like London, there's cameras and, and other things. Um, they deploy spy dust. In fact, I'm convinced that's why I have white hair from spy dust in, in Moscow and these other places. Um, around the embassy, you know, we found that, for example, they built into the scaffolding when they would do work around the embassy, electronic gear to try to listen in through our windows and things. I have friends that even in our old embassy would be working and they'd hear noises and would look and would find people scurrying inside the walls of the building trying to put in listening devices and these other kind of things. Of course, we do the same thing to them as well. Um, we, when we built our, the old embassy, and I'll show you a picture of it in a second, was sort of over here on a big ring road, and we built this new embassy. These are all housing here, and they built this whole embassy. <laughs> um, the Russians incredibly built inside when we would buy the, the, the concrete columns, built inside the concrete columns, essentially uh, antenna dipole, so that the top part of the embassy here, I'll see if I show a picture, became the top of the, the dipole, and then they built the bottom part of the dipole antenna throughout the neighborhoods under the streets all the way around our embassy so that they had, the embassy became a giant listening device, a giant um, antenna that could, could send things out on top of all the other ways they find. This is the old embassy, which would be right up here, and then this is the new embassy. We eventually had to tear, we had this red building, we had to tear it down and rebuild the new one with just U.S. workers from the United States to try to create some classified space where we could do things away from, away from the Russians. Uh, and just to, I'll go quick through this, just to give an example of a case. There's a good book just came out on the Gordievsky case uh, that, the, that SIS was running, uh, not necessarily in Moscow, but talks a little bit about other activities in Moscow. Good book called The Billion Dollar Spy about a, uh, a famous case for us. Tolkachev was an expert in Russian military avionics and radar looked down radar, um, who ended up spying for us. Incredible source, uh, totally driven, wanted to destroy the Soviet state. Um, he knew what he was doing so much so that he, he insisted on having a poison suicide pill so that if he got called in and, uh, <laughs> or caught, he could take the suicide pill to kill himself. There was a lot of debate in the CIA, and he eventually insisted that he wouldn't continue working unless he had one of these pills. And he tells a story as he worked, and, it, and as it got more intense, and he believes they were sort of closing in on him. When he would work in his institute, uh, if he got called in by his boss to the office, he was nervous that this might be the chance for him to get 
arrested. He would take the suicide pill out. He'd put it in his mouth behind his gums, go see his boss, and it was just a standard thing. He'd come back out, take the suicide pill back out, and put it in the thing. So you could imagine what it was like, someone who was uh, worried about dying all the time. So just to give a sense of some of the things we did to, in that environment where you're followed everywhere and there's incredible intensity on stopping our activities, one of the things we did up, up there on the right, we created what they call identity transfer. So what we would do is, me, if I was under surveillance all the time, I would go out, try to get free of surveillance for hours and hours and find that I couldn't do that. One of the things we did is we looked through the embassy and found people who clearly didn't have surveillance, janitors or other people we would monitor to try to see. And then we, when we went back to the States, we would, we would sort of recruit that person and say, we need, we need you. What we're going to do is create a full body copy of you. And we're going to set up a thing so when we're in the embassy, we're if there's a party or something, I'm going to go to that party, you're going to go to that party, and then I'm going to find a space in that place to completely, with your clothes and your face, everything become you, the person who doesn't have surveillance. You're going to stay in that party while I then leave. I'm going to go out into the city. I'm going to go out and determine that indeed they think I'm you. I don't have surveillance. I'm going to get free. I'm going to make my meeting. I'm going to then come back, go back into that place, change back into me, and then both of us can leave the party so that the Russians don't realize that they've been had. You know, a simple one we had in the car is if, if there's two of us driving the car and surveillance following us and we have a predetermined long route where we can manipulate surveillance to know where they are behind us and can go around a curve or over a hill, one of us can jump out of the car into the, the woods or something and then we have a sports bag, you can pop up and you pick up, pop up this little fake person in the seat so the surveillance behind you still sees the two people and it would be a complete mask of, of you. And, and, and I could, we had a little button, we could turn the head and stuff. So, that, so as we continued driving, the surveillance still thought the people were in the car and you'd take them off to the other side of town while the person broke away to continue to make a meeting. So those are the kind of things you had to do to make a meeting. But that, the thing to take point of there is we can only manage and run a few sources in a place like Moscow. Of the Russians who might be willing to spy for us around the world, only a small subset are the ones that can really follow directions that are so driven and in such important positions that we need to go to these measures to meet them in a place like Moscow. Most of them will say, listen, we're not going to meet you in Moscow. If you come overseas again, we'll try to hook up with you. And so the point is that there's only a few of those kind of key sources. If we lose them, the chance of us ever getting that kind of access in that place again is unlikely. And, um, and you know, when diplomats are kicked out and spies are kicked out, the ability to sort of revamp up of those kind of operations that takes months to prepare is also unlikely. So here's just, you know, unfortunately, Tolkachev was captured. He wasn't able to get the suicide pill in his mouth and was uh, tried and killed. He was given up by a, a U.S. spy, Alder James. And if he hadn't been given up by Ames, he would have been given up by FBI spy Robert Hansen. So, so essentially, that's the, the end of my thing. You know, the point is, I think, understanding Russian policy means understanding Czechist mentality. Understanding Russian policy means understanding spy mentality. They, you know, it's like you say, if, if everything's a nail, if whatever, you have a hammer. But it's sort of like, so when they look at foreign policy changes, they're going to think of how can they deploy operations? How can they deploy subterfuge and subversion and sabotage? You know, you see this just the other day in, in in uh, the Netherlands with some of the things they're doing. If there's a problem, they're going to try to use their services and use spy techniques to get it out. They're relentless. They're long, they have a longer-term approach than we do. Um, they're going to continue to look for weaknesses. They're smaller. It's an asymmetric way of doing things. You never underestimate their, their willingness to risk, their willingness to sort of the, to do things that we wouldn't do in terms of brutality, the con constant, no concern about lying, no concern about hypocrisy, they understand, you know, if you invade Crimea and we just wait it out, eventually the West is going to focus on different things and they're going to come around. And so that's essentially, I just wanted to, you know, get to, I don't think I have anything, there may be some more stuff, but there's just some books that relate to some of these things you can get at. But um, with that, that's my main thing. Thanks.